All right, so we are going to restart our interview with Drew Misson from Australia uh, here on Liberty Radio. Drew, this is the second time now that I've had to apologize to you inside of an hour. Uh, this, this might be the most ghetto interview you've ever conducted in your life. What do you think? <laughs> it's, it's all right, mate. I've spoken to people who sound like they're talking into a shoe, so this is great <laughs> in comparison. Awesome. Well, at least I can, uh, I can hurdle over that bar and uh, get us to where we need to be. Uh, folks, if you can't tell right now, and hopefully you can't, uh, I've, uh, I've been sweating bullets for about the last 10 minutes due to all the technical difficulties that we have encountered this afternoon. Uh, so I'm not going to make Drew uh, repeat what he said at the beginning of our last failed interview attempt, I'm just going to go back to the question that I asked him first, which was regarding the reality of what is happening on the ground in Australia and New Zealand. And hopefully you didn't forget uh, too much of what you were going to say, Drew. Um, yeah. So the question was around how accurate was the representation of Australia and the totalitarianism that was being shown internationally well it was scarily accurate um if anything it probably didn't show enough of what was happening we had people being arrested within their homes uh, for social media posts for inciting protests against the government um pregnant women being handcuffed behind their back and taken into custody we had people being choked out on the streets for not wearing a mask because you know that's all about health and safety we had drones flying around on beaches in enforcing curfews. We had five kilometer limits from our houses, two hours of exercise. We we're living in the world's largest open air prison. We kind of went back to what we started off as, as a penal colony. And it's like, they were just giving us a taste of what, what our ancestors had started off with. It's, um, it's really concerning that that level of authoritarianism took place in Australia and the majority of Australians were very apathetic to it, were quick to to bend over, to just keep their head down, and that the international community really didn't have much to say about it. Like, in comparison to the rest of the world, Australia by far had the harshest lockdown conditions outside of China. Um, I think the next step was if they were starting to weld us inside our own houses and our own apartment complexes, that's when it probably would have ticked up a bit more. But it was bad enough that we had isolation camps and police knocking on your door to make sure that you've been isolating. I myself was a a close contact of one of my students during the time because I was an authorized worker and I had to go into isolation for seven days at home. And I had a knock on my door three times within that week to make sure I was home and not out and about in the community. So it was very much uh, a sneak peek into the Orwellian state of a, a new world order, which unfortunately I think the likes of Agenda 2030 and the WEF and WHO and all these three and two letter agencies internationally want to bring about as a form of globalism. So they were literally physically going to your home and checking to make sure that you were quarantining. Oh, absolutely. Um, the police in my area didn't have much to do at that time. And, you know, they, they had a list of names of people that who would, who were close contacts given to them by the government and they just do a casual drive around on their, their normal patrols. They added that into the mix and they just do a, a knock on doors to make sure people are in their homes while patrolling the streets to make sure people weren't exceeding their two hours of exercise or exceeding the five kilometer limit from their house. Oh my God, that is insane. I mean, even in like the, the country that I think was the most authoritarian um, on the American continent was Canada. I don't think that's really a, a point that can be argued at this, uh, you know, at this particular time. Uh, but even they weren't doing anything as draconian as that. Like, where did the government, were they like citing statutes that were allowing them to, to carry out this behavior? How were they justifying it? Well, this is the interesting thing. Australia is a, a parliamentary commonwealth, so we're a part of the crown. 
Um, at a federal level, we've got our own version of the Constitution. Unfortunately, it's very wishy-washy in comparison to the American one. The American Constitution has a lot of teeth and a lot of protections. In the Australian Constitution, a lot of it is implied. We don't have a Bill of Rights. Essentially, if going off that metric, we don't have many rights at all. We have implied rights and implied freedoms. Unfortunately, because those are implied, um, it's very murky and becomes very muddy as to how far government can overreach. You throw in on top of that, we're a federation of states, and ultimately our states have individual power, and the federal government's more so a figurehead that can imply national taxes, defence, all that type of a thing. So what we had was we had a, a federal government saying, you know, our prime minister at the time was saying, I don't agree with these mandates. I don't agree with these lockdowns, but, you know, we got to do what we got to do. Ultimately, it's up to the states. He was handballing the, 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 the guilt trip to the state premiers who really didn't give a shit. They, they were going really hard with as much as they can, as hard as they could. They invoked a, a lot of emergency powers acts um, to do with the pandemic, which gave them realistically ultimate control on what they could and couldn't do. Hmm. And so they just went for it. Yeah, uh, my state particularly, Victoria and, and our capital city, Melbourne, has the mantle of being the most locked down place in the world. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. I hadn't heard that. Well, and much of what I've seen coming out of Australia, uh, as far as, you know, speeches from government officials, it's... It's interesting because you see the majority of the public figures towing the official narrative line, right? Like they're all, they were all talking about slowing the spread. And then when the shots came around, they were about rolling out the shots and everybody, you know, uh, run out and get yours as soon as you can Uh, do it, do it for your neighbor. Uh, Oh, and also uh, of course in New Zealand, they were saying when you go to, the supermarket don't talk to the other people in the supermarket because you might get bad information from those people uh, and you know all, all of that fun sort of stuff the only person that I saw dissenting from what we'll call the party line coming out of Australia was I believe his name is Senator Roberts is that right uh, he's one of them yes yeah, well, he's at he, a federal level. Yeah. Okay, so he's the guy at the federal level. So he would be comparable, I would say, to like a Rand Paul in the United States, who was one of the few in the U.S. Uh, federal level Senate who was actually pushing back against you know most everything. Yeah, I'd say that's a fair approximation. Yeah. Interesting. I find it I find it very interesting that it seems like each of the the Western nations, uh, or maybe you would call them the Commonwealth nations, they were all allowed one. They all got one dissenting voice. Even the EU was allowed to have a, a dissenting voice in Christine Anderson. So Yeah, it was almost as if they had the illusion of someone being on your side that ultimately couldn't do anything, right? particularly within Australia because of that federal and state level um, intervention of power it couldn't actually occur. It was so bad in my state that we had what were called nudge units, which was a government-funded, taxpayer-funded, multi-million dollar psychological warfare program, which has all come out now, where they were literally trying to, and in their documentation says, scare the shit out of the population into complying. So that's where the like the whole kill counters came up on screens, the daily press conferences. Jeez, we had people watching television for three years, listening to our premier telling the world that everyone's going to die. You have to stay in your home. You're killing grandma. The psychological impact on that is is insane. And what this nudge unit was comprised of was psychologists and other mental health workers that knew how the, the human mind works and what what outside factors can uh, influence, uh, influence thought and direct behavior. Yeah, well, and Australia wasn't the only nation that had those nudge units. Uh, I discovered very early on that there was a 
uh, think tank type of organization operating out of the United Kingdom. I'm trying to remember their name uh, right off the top of my head and it's not coming to me, but this was essentially how they had laid out for the media, for government officials, uh, for anyone who was going to be in a perceived position of authority and interacting with the public. This is what you want to say. This is how you want to say it. This is how you want to rebut, you know, anybody that disagrees with you. Um, and it seems based on that information that there was more of a, let's say marketing campaign around the uh, the perceived disease that was floating around in the world as opposed to anything that you could actually observe in your environment. Yeah, it was almost as if they had the same, um, the same company they were getting their script from because we saw across multiple different nations on the planet the same talking points, um, which is, it's, it's very odd because supposedly we ha were all given the same science, but then at the same time, every single nation had different uh, restrictions in place. Uh, within Australia, it was 1.5 meter distances between each other mm -hmm. for social distancing. Then some nations had two meters. Um, some people in other parts of the world had six feet. So the science wasn't even settled in amongst themselves, but the talking points were all the same, which is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, you know, exactly what you want to do if you're uh, <laughs> you're working a psychological campaign. You want to make sure everybody's on the same page, uh, so that folks like you and me don't start asking uncomfortable questions, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. So, what is the sentiment among the rank and file? Uh, of the Australian people, like the, the folks that you come into contact with on a daily basis, how are they holding up and how are they handling the situation? Um, I think a lot of people have come around. It's probably not going to be enough, but I'm hopeful. Uh, what, we, what we found was in my state, 98% of the population were vaccinated due to mandates, um, which was pretty much based on anyone with a job at one point. So the majority of the Victorian population have had at least one of the jibby jabs. Once they got to number two and the mandates were lifted, people have said, nah, we're not going back. We're not putting up with this anymore. We're not having it. A very, very small minority within the population have gone back for boosters, number three, number four, number five, number six, and what have you. People are over it. They're trying to call it um, vaccine fatigue so much that they're trying to pump up the pressure around flu vaccinations because traditionally in, in our state and our country, a lot of people up um, take up the flu vaccine each year. Well, that's nosedived by 50% uh, in the past two years. People just aren't taking anything anymore. There's a lot of distrust within the medical establishment. Um, the TGA, TGA, our Therapeutic Goods Association, who is responsible for the book around what constitutes as a vaccine and what is um, given consent, they they went against their own bylaws and stated that the vaccine wasn't coerced, even though under the definition in their own handbook, it says coercion cannot be given, consent cannot be given through coercion of financial means. So, you know, majority of the population were told, if you don't get this, you lose your job. So that informed the majority of the population that these people don't actually care about us. So we're seeing a really good movement towards people questioning what government really has in mind for us. We A lot of people now know that government doesn't have our best interests at heart. So we we're starting to see and hear conversations outside of the, um, the medical establishment and outside of COVID. People are questioning taxes. People are questioning government expenditures. People are questioning the gravy train that we see these lifelong politicians on. We've actually got a, a quite important referendum coming up in our country called the Voice to Parliament, where uh, it's being proposed to the Australian population whether we enshrine in our constitution an Aboriginal voice to Parliament. Um, and it's divided the country in the most horrible ways, but we're looking at a no vote going through and the majority of Australians have cottoned on to this being a UN agenda through the UNDRIP principles to try and make a land grab within Australia. Really? 
Like yeah, how, so the people how do who, they have it constructed? So the, at the moment, this is the interesting thing. Um, it's literally, it's just being told by the opposition, the group that are proposing this, that it's a modest change to our constitution that would just enshrine the words, um, uh, a, an assembly, a representative body of a First Nations people would have a voice to parliament where they can suggest things to the parliament um, based on their day-to-day life. So to the average person, that sounds like a great thing that um, First Nations people get a, a bit of representation. But the idea of enshrining in a constitution with no um, black and white detail on its power and its scope and what it can do, it's quite concerning because when we look at the potentials that could come out of it, you're looking at treaties being signed, you're looking at land being taken away from Australians and, and given back to First Nations peoples. You're seeing um, taxes, it's called pay the rent in a slang term around here, that if this does go through, every Australian's going to be paying a tax to whatever First Nations um, land they are currently on. Um, oh, wow. There's a whole heap of principles there that link back to the UNDRIP document in the UN about uh, bringing up First Nations people's rights that really just infringe on the average life of the Australian person. So, yeah, it sounds like it's more about making sure that once the land is taken it's profitable than it is about like returning it to you know the original uh, inhabitants of the area yes and this this is the idea that we know that bureaucracy happens at all levels of government it happens at federal state and even happens at a local council level so the real danger here for first nations people is that you're going to get a legislative assembly of Um, or a representative body of, say, maybe 21 members that are supposed to represent over 500 different First Nations in Australia, which is an impossible task in itself. So naturally, you're going to have certain tribes um, overruling other people, potentially taking other tribes' land. It'll be an absolute shit show at the end of the day if it ever goes through because that level of corruption... Is is, has been traditionally held in Australia within um, these types of advisory bodies to the government. There's 35 billion a year in Australia is spent on First Nations peoples trying to bridge the gap. Um, First Nations people in Australia have a lower life expectancy, lower outcomes economically, all these factors compared to the Anglo-Australian, they're a lot lower. So the government for over 30 years now is trying to be close that gap and all that seems to be happening is billions of dollars keeps being spent on it and the outcomes don't change. So instead of asking the question, you know, where's all this money gone? Why isn't it getting to the people in these remote communities? Why isn't it helping people? Why isn't it improving health? They're quickly just going to let's add another level of bureaucracy and hopefully that solves the problem. Oh yeah. It sounds like the American strategy of if money doesn't fix it, throw more money at it. Yeah, um, my printing machine goes burr. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's how the U.S. federal government has operated now for uh, a little over 100 years uh, at this point. Uh, it's just, you know, one more spending bill after the other. Oh, that, that Band-Aid fell off? All right, let's 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 pay for a shiny new one. We'll stick it on there, and hopefully it'll last at least a couple more years. Yeah, it's like the sinking ship and you're trying to plug the holes with bubble gum and they just keep mm-hmm. popping out. Yeah. So basically no difference <laughs> between the way <laughs> Australia is run and the way the other Commonwealth nations are run. That's that's kind of what I'm hearing. Yeah, well, it's 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 definitely the crown. The crown has this this parliamentary system where at the end of the day, you know, we are um subjects of the king. Or the late queen and end of the day we don't have the rights that are enshrined in a constitution like the american constitution has um well even though even... the five eyes all together have their issues and the u.s is a part of that but the, yeah. the crown has a unique level of of us still being the uh the paupers that are working the fields just in a modern context well and i think a lot of Americans are starting to realize that a lot of the rights that they thought had been promised to them are uh, suddenly in jeopardy, or maybe even they've already lost them. You know, just depends on who's doing the accounting. 
Well, absolutely. Look at the variation in the interpretation of the the American Constitution from state to state in America. Mm. Um, there's a, a heck of a lot of states that seem to be very anti-gun. Where you know, last time I checked, it's your Second Amendment. Yeah, yeah, and and the Second Amendment has four words in it that apparently are the most mysterious in the English language when you put them one after the other because. Uh, apparently shall not be infringed is just open to interpretation. Like it's not clear at all, according to the government. Well, this is, this is the world we live in. We live in a world where it's almost like there's two different realities coexisting in the same space where suddenly we live in a world where there's chest feeding people and um, <laughs> birthing people. The definitions of words even in the most fundamental biological sense, are changing before our very eyes and we're expected to just accept that's that's how it is now? Well, if it says those words shall not be infringed in the founding document of your country, it shall not be infringed. It's very simple. It's in black and white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's clear to me uh, as somebody who's been studying language for mm, probably about 40 years now, uh, it... I, I don't have any question as, as to what those words mean. But then again, typically when you start involving lawyers, that's where things get really complicated and really murky uh, very, very quickly. So Yes, the old legalese and the weasel words that come out of the court system. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So on a personal note, Drew, because again, I don't know a whole lot about you. So this is an opportunity for me to learn as well as uh, my audience. In your life, have you always lived in Australia or have you had a chance to get out and see other parts of the world? Um, I actually went to the United States when I was 21. So I, I saved a whole heap of money, went over to the States. I was there for about five weeks. I started off in New York and I did the whole Route 66 thing, traveling down through the South all the way up into to California. That was a big eye opener, um, being able to say, see the way the United States is, but also seeing how fractured the United States is. I, I didn't think it was that bad until I got there. Um, a lot of people always hark on about how amazing LA is and how amazing New York is. I got there and New York to me was just Melbourne on crack. It was another big city with a lot of rude people in it. And mm. I found that the further south I went, the more genuine, the more open and honest people were. They didn't care that you were a foreigner um, visiting their country. They were they were quite open to you experiencing and enjoying their country, whereas the big cities and those, those states on each coast, they were probably the most xenophobic people I've ever come across, which is quite funny. Yeah. Yeah. And I would agree with you because I spent a couple of years in my early twenties in the nineties, uh, traveling all over the United States as well. Now it helped that I was actually born in the United States. Right. So I didn't have to apply for a visa or any of that stuff, pay for a plane ticket. Um, but yeah, I got to see a lot of the country and see, the differences as well as the similarities between the different parts of the country. And one thing I can tell folks listening is if you have not had a chance to get out and travel around uh, a country as large as something like the United States, or I would imagine even Australia as well, do it while you still have a chance. Because most of the stories that you have been told about other places that you have never been to, they're a large part fiction. And you really only begin to understand what these places are like when you can go and interact with the people that live there. And as far as what I found for America... <clears throat> When it comes to the normal everyday people, you know, the people going out, working nine to five, uh, just trying to feed their families and all of that sort of thing. There's not a whole lot of differences between those people ideologically. You know, it's they they all have uh, a very similar value system that they follow and that they adhere to, um, even though, 
you know, there's not a lot of overlap, like you say, between like Atlanta and Los Angeles. But the regular people, there, there's not a whole lot of difference. Um, and I think that kind of sounds uh, a little bit like what you were saying as well, Drew, just the, the chance to, to be able to experience that. Yeah, and it's even though we're both Western democratic countries, which I think we can take away the democratic side from Australia at the moment now, considering the past three years, but at the time you're going to a uh, another Western country, we have the same language, we have a lot of the same cultural traits, but it was still such an amazing experience to see the differences that we sh- we have, but also the similarities that we share. I think for any Australian, if you're going to go want go anywhere in the world, the United States is a great place because it really brings into perspective how underdeveloped Australia truly is. Like when I was on the east coast of the United States, I could travel by car, by bus, however I was traveling. I could travel no less than 10, 15 minutes, and there's town after town after town, big city, town, big city, medium-sized city. There's always a developed area. In Australia, where I am on the East Coast, which is the most developed part of Australia, you can travel from anywhere up to two and a half hours and not see anything. Hmm. Australia is so underdeveloped still. It's people um, people think of Australia as, as first world, but I think fundamentally we've got a long way to go still. I would like to have the opportunity to see some of that for myself. Um, Unfortunately, I don't know that we're going to be afforded those kinds of luxuries uh, for very much longer. Getting back to the rollout of Agenda 2030, Drew, uh, what are you seeing as far as developments on the ground in Australia in terms of the infrastructure for the smart city projects and the, the track trace and database systems uh, that the parasite class want to employ to make sure that, you know, folks like you and I don't get out of line. Uh, What are you seeing on the ground as far as that goes? Okay, within my own state, we're starting to see the centralisation of Melbourne being the hub for the entire population of the state. I'm from a state of roughly 6.5 million, um, and over 5 million of that population actually lives within Melbourne already. So in the regional areas where I am, it's a very small population size. What we are seeing is we're seeing a lot of investment into trains and railways. Highways are falling into disrepute that they look like third world nations Roads, potholes, the worst infrastructure you could see in Australia is in my state when it comes to road services. But there's a hell of a lot of money being spent on the train system. There's this multi-billion dollar, trillion dollar at this point, um, infrastructure called the City Loop, where they're getting all trains off the ground, building them up onto these high-rise tracks that go around the city of Melbourne, almost as a a way of ushering the people around to go to their little workspaces within a 15 minute city on top of that we're seeing a massive infrastructure rollout of 5g even in regional victoria where i am they are scattered everywhere it looks like if you look on a map it would look like victoria has herpes or there's that many around so the infrastructure of um, interconnectivity and, and telecommunications is being put in place but we also see the idea of 15 minute cities or 20 minute neighborhoods occurring where it's not the state doing it, it's individual small city councils. So I've recently had a, a guest come on um, a little while ago speak about the Yarra City Council, which is a place in Victoria, not far outside of Melbourne, where it's the first city in Victoria and Australia to actually sign up to the 20 Minute Neighbourhoods Initiative. Um, naturally, the people in the area didn't want this. They saw what happened in Oxford in the UK, and they tried to block this from happening. They went to council meetings, they protested it, and all that resulted in was the, the local council there barring people from attending their meetings anymore, which is actually uh, unconstitutional. It's against their own bylaws. So this community group took them to court, to the Supreme Court. Court of Australia. So this is a massively unheard of event where a local city council has gone to the Supreme Court. It went through the motions of the court system and what ended up eventuating was the judge said that 
he couldn't actively speak on what a local council can and can't do. Um, they can implement a UN agenda or strategy when it comes to um, sustainability goals, the 16 ESG goals, and it's not his place to say. He also made out that it's up to the council whether they have uh, input from constituents at their meetings at all. And at bare minimum, all they have to do is provide a Zoom link. So we're seeing it at a very local level. They are rolling out these UN agendas at a local level. I think so many people are concerned with what's happening federally or state level politics, but it's coming at us from all angles at the moment. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the C40 cities organization? I am. And Melbourne is one of them. That's, that's what I was going to ask you is what uh, cities in Australia had been uh, handpicked. For that group, um, Melbourne and Sydney, Victoria, Australia seems to be the canary in the coal mine for the West. Whatever they want to do internationally amongst Western countries, they try in Australia first, and then even at a macro level, Victoria is the model for all of Australia. Um, we're mm-hmm. a very socialist left state at the moment. Um, we have been quite a while with our little dictator Dan in power. Um, Melbourne seems to be the the testing ground for a lot of this stuff. Um, all of the the militarized police you saw during COVID shooting civilians in the back and driving around their bear cats and using owl rads and all that type of military level um, gear, that was all provided to Melbourne because Melbourne signed up to the um, Safe Cities Initiative of the UN, which is uh, a funding program to help prevent um, international and domestic terrorism. So all these things are slowly being put in place that tiptoe into tyranny where the the system's being built around us and we don't even realize it. Yeah. So, all right, let me ask you this question because this just popped into my head uh, while you were speaking. How many times has Melbourne been the target of international terrorists? Well, this is the funny part. I would say it would be zero. We've had what you would consider lone wolf people, right. which are highly mentally unwell people. We had a a gentleman drive a car down um, the CBD of Melbourne and kill quite a few people. We had a reoccurrence of that recently. Um, we had a situation where a uh, an Islamic, air quotes, terrorist at the time um, had a siege at a coffee shop, that type of a deal. But Beyond that, there hasn't been the level of terrorism that you would see uh, within the United States or overseas, say, like the London bombings or things like that. Mm. Australia hasn't been touched by that type of a thing. Well, and it also doesn't seem like Australia has had the influx of migrants that some other Western nations have seen. Is, Is that correct or is that just something that we're not being told about? We do have them, but being that as the Australian population is so small, a little over 25 million, I believe, last count, that the government seems to think the only way we can get through um, financial issues is to import more immigrants into Australia. So we do have quite a high immigrant intake um, that has boosted our population, but it's nothing in comparison to the United States. I think over the next two to five years, the Labor government, who's our federal government at the moment, they the left wing government, they are wanting to bring in like two million people over the next five years. Which, for a country that's as small as Australia, population wise and infrastructure wise, that's going to be an absolute devastating impact on our economy. Oh, you can't yeah. just add an extra two million people overnight and expect it to be all hunky dory. We've already got a a financial crisis, cost of living crisis, and a housing crisis in our country. We have over a hundred thousand homeless people at any given moment that can't get into public housing because there's not enough. So they want to bring in another two million people who will naturally get into that public housing. Oh wow! Well, yeah, because if you're bringing in two million to a country that only has 25 million, you're hitting almost 10% of the existing population. Uh, That's not a small number. Um, And unfortunately, with the way the political climate is in the world today, I don't think you could point to any one country right now as being uh, sort of a cultural melting pot. Uh, It's certainly not 
in the United States anymore with the, the politics of division that we're seeing happen. Um, yeah, it seems to me that the only reason that you would make a move like that where you're bringing in people from a foreign land is to bolster the labor market. Or yeah, and and generally they tend to vote left leaning because the left right. of the side of politics tends to give them a lot of things. Right, right. The the same tactics that every single color revolution that's ever taken place <laughs> on the face of this planet uh, has has uh, supplied for the the people in power. So, speaking of the the people in power who probably shouldn't be. Uh, I do have a question here from one of your podcast mates, uh, Ashley, uh, Think Change Repeat from Union of the Unknowns, and she dropped into the Liberty Radio Telegram channel this question yesterday. Who do you think is really running this whole clown show that we're forced to live through? (laughs) <laughs> I know what this question stems from. Um, we're talking about Klaus Schwab and like who's really in control and who's, who's the echelons of power. And I made a statement that I think Klaus Schwab is like the Walmart greeter of the whole situation. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, she referenced that the, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> he's, the, um, he's definitely the person that's allowed to be out in the open. I think if we know their names, they are at very least middle management. Um, I think that the people that the parasite class, whatever you want to call them, these people that do really run the world, these shadow governments, if you know their name, they're not important. They survive by living in secrecy. And as a person who's recently found Christ, I tend to believe that this does go all the way to the top of um, the, the one that goes by many names, the great deceiver, um, Beelzebub, Lucifer, the devil, whatever you want to call him, that's the moniker that I think is really in control. And you've got various stages or levels of people or entities that are, are taking orders from the top. I'll put it that way. I think that it goes a hell of a lot deeper than just the the evil that humanity could possibly have on itself. I think that that evil stems from something. I don't think it's a natural form that humanity goes into. I think it's definitely influenced by um, outside sources. That's uh, that's an interesting way to look at it because I have heard other researchers say the exact same remarks. In you know, in other words, that if you're seeing somebody on television or you know their name or you're being told that they're you. Know, their net worth is, you know, however many billion dollars, uh, they're probably just front men because the people who have the amount of wealth that would allow them to remain in the shadows so that you don't know what their names are, uh, those are the people that are really pulling the strings. Uh, and the funny thing about that is you can, if, if you really do your due diligence, and you go back through history, right? And you look at the various power centers of the world uh, and you trace family names through time, you start to see certain names disappearing from the timeline while other ones kind of rise to prominence. But it's usually, you know, all the same bloodlines. It's just this one was chosen to be the public face for, you know, however much longer. Yeah, I, th- I think it's a, a mix of that, but I'm I'm not completely dismissive of the idea that people are starting to find out information about who's possibly behind the curtain. We live in the technological age where information can be shared, say, from Australia right now, all the way to the United States. Um, I think the internet and the interconnectivity of the global stage is a genie that got out of the bottle from that from them. I think names, certain things will pop up from time to time, but I think really a lot of that's locked down. A great example is um, BlackRock and Vanguard. If it wasn't for the the advent of um, international communications, the internet, 
a lot of people wouldn't know that BlackRock or Vanguard are the sh- um, controlling shareholders in most companies. Unless you are actively working in the share market, the average citizen would have no idea who these companies were, let alone they have the controlling stakes in most companies and organizations across the world. Yeah. Well, I would actually argue that the average citizen still doesn't really know who they are <laughs> or what they're that doing. Is- and again, Fair. that just <laughs> speaks volumes to what we were just saying. Right, that the people who are actually directing things and making things happen and driving us toward this agenda, the average person has never heard of them, don't don't even know that they exist and that they're doing these things. And I think in large part, these people rely on the ignorance of the masses in order to be able to get away with this stuff. Yeah, well, it's, it hasn't changed since the Roman Empire that you keep a population fed, warm. They're going to be complacent and they're going to let things happen. We've got the bread and circuses of today is your Netflix and chill and your Disney Plus and you're watching the Super Bowl and going down to McDonald's to get a feed in, in the middle of the night. We've got so many modern day conveniences that there's no need to question what's going on because for the most part, this is a generalization, for the most part, People are doing pretty well. They're they're fed, they're sheltered, they get sleep. They have all the basic necessities. Sure, cost of living is is, is quite high. Sure, fuel is expensive. Um, sure, people have to work two or three jobs just to get by. I'm not dismissing that. But for the most part, our most fundamental needs are met. That Maslow's hierarchy of needs, a lot of those aspects are being met, but it's all controlled in certain aspects of of what we can and can't do and we don't realize it yeah yeah Uh, i would agree with that so i want to switch gears uh for a minute while i still have you for a few minutes uh because i did get a number of questions from the liberty radio audience to ask you yesterday uh this one comes from aj Uh, And if you want to choose to believe that that's Alex Jones, that's up to you. (laughs) So have you personally followed some of the leads into Anthony Kidman's death and had a look at some of the contradictions there? I haven't gone deep on it, but I do have enough of an understanding of it. That's something I need to look into more. Um, Outside of my show, I, I have a, I co-host a show called Conspiracy Theater 3000 where I break down films for hidden symbolism, um, conspiracy, all that type of fun stuff. So naturally, a lot of names of celebrities pop up and connections with secret societies and whatnot. The Kidman family is very, very strange. Um, you don't he say. He was a mate. <laughs> well, he was a Mason. I think a lot of people would have remembered Nicole Kidman had that little clip not that long ago where she was eating bugs and trying to make it all cool and hip. But you look at the the interactions she's had in her her professional life. Hers are questionable enough. But you look at her father. Her father, um, in the late sixties, moved to the United States, Washington D.C. of all places, like the swamp itself. He's a he was a very well respected academic within Australia. Um, he was a lecturer of biochemistry at Monash University. He's um, a psychologist by trade. So he went to to the hub of what um, satanic sexual ritual abuse and MK Ultra was. It was Washington DC. We know that those programs were happening. There's enough FOIA requests and things that go on. People know this stuff happened. So one of Australia's most preeminent academics moved to the states, studied there, worked there for a while, came back to Australia, and um, started this this group. Um, What's the name of it? Um, the Foundation for Life Sciences is what he called it. And it was a nonprofit organization focused on the mental health of youth. So we're seeing a lot of uh, interleaving um, aspects and themes of MK Ultra, satanic mm-hmm. ritual abuse, in his field of work. Um, well, we know that Nicole- on children as well. It's specifically children. That's right. We know that Nicole Kidman herself has had some controversy with the Beninsalaga um, campaign recently where she took forever to disavow it and the pedophilia connections with that. But 
there's been quite a few people that have come out and accused um, Nicole Kidman's father, Anton Kidman, of pedophilia, rape, and sexual misconduct. That if he was alive, he would have been hauled before before a court because it's at the same time of the Me Too movement. He's quite prominent. Those are things that couldn't go unanswered. The interesting thing is when this type of stuff started to come out and people found out he was actually a Mason and he'd had all this training in America and there were connections to MK Ultra, he mysteriously died. He was overseas and he just died for unknown reasons. I think he was in Thailand or somewhere in Southeast Asia from memory. And it was so, so odd, the the details surrounding his death that the Australian Federal Police wanted to investigate it which is quite odd that uh, the federal police in Australia who are generally just associated with um, preventing um, gun um, smuggling, drugs coming into Australia, a lot of high-level stuff internationally coming into Australia, they were concerned about going overseas and investigating the death of one of our most prominent, air quotes, academics. Hmm. Yeah, because what I read... Uh, and and I'm certainly no authority on the subject at all. I just learned about this yesterday myself. What I read about the details surrounding his death were that there's like three different stories of how he actually died. Like, and and each story takes place in a different location, right? Yeah, it's 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 very odd. It's almost if you were to speculate and put that little tinfoil hat on, it's almost as if the allegations and the heat he was starting to get made him a liability and mm. he needed to be dealt with. No, well, I mean that's always a possibility. We've seen that happen with other people in the program as well. So to me, just the connection to the MK Ultra program and the fact that I believe, if memory is serving correct, he was actually uh, under commission from the National Institutes of Mental Health while he was in the United States. Is that right? Well, that is correct. Um, yeah. It was one of those uh, trade specialist people to upskill and they can bring it back home. He's... He's a very, very interesting person when you look into his background. Um, like we know Nicole Kidman starred in Eyes Wide Shut with Tom Cruise, and we know mm -hmm. what that film's all about. He's commented as saying at the premiere of that, or after the premiere when he'd seen the film of his his daughter's performance, that it rings true to a lot of his life experiences. So you have to try and think about which character in that film was his life potentially based on or what experiences in that film um, rang true for him? Because that's a very strange statement to make a, about a film, which is about uh, satanic ritual abuse, mm -hmm. mind control, um, secret societies. He's just let it, he kind of let it slip and put it out in the open. But I think that's the hubris of these peoples at, at times. Not only do they need that kind that karmic balance of letting us know what they're doing, I think they don't care a lot of the time. They can just make these throwaway statements and know that nothing's going to happen. Well, I think sometimes, uh, and I don't disagree with you uh, as far as that goes, but I think sometimes it's also that these people are tapped. Uh, into the system because of the specific skill set that they have and they don't know that they are expendable uh, because of course they're told you know just like any of the rest of us if if you've ever been through a, a program in government school where you were told going into it that you're special and you're not like the other kids they keep feeding you that so over time, uh, that, uh, that programming becomes reinforced and people start to believe it themselves. So he may have gotten to the point in his own life where he was like, well, nothing's happened to me so far. I guess I'm probably mostly okay. I can say whatever I want, let something slip. And then they were like, all right, he's got to go. Yeah, they could, that could have been the case. They just clipped him for, he thought he was out in the clear and could start to talk and maybe you got clipped for it. Yeah. Um, but I think if you look at the way Nicole Kidman in her 
professional life, in her career, the way she presents herself and acts in interviews and films, she just screams someone who's gone through the MK Ultra program itself. Mm. A lot of her interactions, the way she holds herself, there's almost like a level of the engine's running and no one's behind the wheel. It's a, a very vacant yes. look she has when she's talking, which is, it's almost, it gives you shivers. And, and um, just to look at it, you know that there's not quite someone there or there's the shadow of someone that used to be there. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there's the shadow of something else yeah. there. Maybe she's a skin of... suit for something. Right. Right. Well, I, that's the thing is, so when I was young, I wanted to pursue a career in the entertainment industry. Right. And I thought I was gonna, I was going to grow up to be a world famous actor. I was going to be rich and famous and people were going to love me and shower me with attention. And I quickly found out that that is not how the business works at all. But in the course of time, uh, studying to become an actor as well as then later in life kind of revisiting the entertainment industry with a more skeptical eye than what I had earlier in life. I've heard stories from other performers all throughout my life who will say something to the effect of, you know, I don't know how I do it. It's like something else takes control of me. And I'm then able to give this magnificent performance. And then once the performance is over, I kind of snap back into my normal self. I, I can't count how many times I've heard stories like that. Yeah, it's, it's a strange situation where you look at what you would consider celebrities to be today, whether that's musicians, actors, what have you, sports stars, Probably more, not so much for sport, but let's go to acting and, and um, the music industry. Far more often than not, the majority of these people have connections somewhere in their life. They're either connected to intelligence, they're connected to um, academia, or they ha already have pre-existing um, family members who are within the group, right? It's It happens, but it's quite rare for there to be a natural grassroots person to come up as a great actor or a great musician. That happens less and less now. So it's, it's a situation of a lot of these people, they're either born into it and they're set up to do certain things, or if they do have natural gifts of, of the artistic field, they have to be co-opted into it or put into compromising positions where they toe the line and do what the establishment wants. Well, yeah, it's, uh, it's long been known for, uh, again, anybody that had stars in their eyes growing up, that you were only going to get so far in the business unless you play the game. And that's exactly what they call it, is playing the game. And that can mean anything from compromising yourself morally to compromising yourself physically over and over and over again. Um, and and, and yet, spiritually on top of that. Oh, yeah. Well, I you mean, look it's, at the, the it majority of record together. labels out there. They Every time that uh, album gets released, they have a little altar that they put it on and they set candles around it, which is very um, like a Kabbalistic type of a, a situation that these people put up. They put these totems and these symbols all around this album in hopes that it's going to boost its profit margins and its rankings on the charts. So, you know, a lot of people out there may not believe in the spiritual side of things or the spiritual war that a lot of Christians believe are in. You may not believe in that, but geez, the bad guys seem to believe in it 110%. Yeah. And I've heard a lot of people making the point recently that it doesn't matter whether you believe in it or not. The people who are doing these things believe in it very much, and you're not going to change their mind on that. So they are going to keep acting in accordance with that belief. No, you can't debate them out of being a uh, Satanist. <laughs> They're going to keep going. It's bred into them. Yeah. So what are you doing yourself uh, to help protect and prepare yourself and your family, the people that you care about around you uh, from the tyranny that I think we can agree has been descending 
all around us for the last four years? Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of things. It has to be multifaceted because what's happening to us is multifaceted. So there's a level of financial security. Um, I didn't want to get caught with my pants down ever again like I did during COVID. Um, we had financial requirements, had to keep a roof over our head during COVID. So I was one of the people, many people in my state that was coerced into taking the jabs. I don't want that situation to ever happen to me again. So my wife and I worked really, really hard to get ourselves into a, a financial situation where we don't have any debts. That's gone. That's done. We're putting lots of savings away. We're um, diversifying ourselves so that we're covered should anything happen. Um, on another level, you can look at like preparedness. I've, we've got food storages. I've got an abundance of tools. I'm upskilling myself in different areas that I normally wasn't um, proficient in. Uh, we're looking at um, moving out to my to my wife's family farm in the future. That's a goal for us. Um, 600 acre beef farm. So it's pulling ourselves away from the system as much as we can while still being a part of it. Because I think it's it's that noble idea that you can just go off and be a homesteader or a homeschool and you can detach from the system. It's a great pipe dream, but the system's built in such a way, particularly within Australia, that you have to have your foot in both worlds in a lot of regards. So it's setting yourself up financially to be in a good position, um, physically to be in a good position, uh, making sure that you're hedging your bets on multiple things happening and praying that none of them actually eventuate. Um, spiritually, I have myself have become a Christian. I was a person that absolutely hated Bible thumpers. I'd roll my eyes whenever I'd hear a Christian talk because I thought it was all hogwash. But a couple of events happened in my life that, for me, proved the existence of God, which was <laughs> a, a, a great um thing for my wife because she's an Anglican. She was raised that way. She attended private Anglican school. So I've kind of come around. I was the black sheep that married into the family. And and now I'm someone who who believes the word and who is actively trying to upskill myself and become more knowledgeable of the teaching of the Bible and the history surrounding it and what the other side is doing. Like I think to know your enemy is the only way that you can prevent what they're doing or defeat them. So there's a lot of very dark rabbit holes you go down, but I think if you've got that shining light and the sword and the shield of of the word, that I think that's probably the greatest protection at the end of the day anyone can have. Yeah, I think I would agree with you on that. Uh, and it definitely follows the rule of thumb that you prepare for the worst, hope and pray for the best. And uh, if everything goes right, you should hit somewhere right in the middle. Yeah, I, I don't think you um that's I think the middle is the best a lot of people could could hope and pray for because you can plan everything out to the nth degree and then the universe life will throw you a curveball and it'll be something you didn't anticipate but hopefully you've got enough things in place for other areas that you can prop yourself up. Yeah, and, and today was a perfect example of that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Drew, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Uh, where can folks who are hearing you for the first time today, where can they connect with more of your work? Uh, you can find me at Your Missing the Point podcast, M I S E N. It's a play on my last name. Uh, you can find me on all the usual podcatchers. Um, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram. I am quite hard to find on those platforms. I'm heavily shadow banned. Um, and search suggestion ban. So I've got Zuckerberg and Elon Musk cucking me at the moment, trying to prevent my reach for the show. So everything that you've seen from from my show, if you're a listener, that's been purely organic word of mouth, which I think is probably the best publicity anyone can ever have um, with a podcast or a show that they're producing. So I'm quite proud of that. Um, if you're a new person listening to me, please reach out, check out my backlog of shows and let me know what you think. Awesome. How long have you been podcasting? Uh, a little over 12 months now. Really? Wow. So did you have a uh, public, speak public speaking experience prior or you just kind of dove in? It probably helps that I'm a teacher. <laughs> I yeah. could um, talk till the cows came home, but no, I've never had public speaking. And it's actually quite funny because I could... I could present to a class of students. I could present to a class of teachers and teach them things. 
but I've still got this, it's almost a sense of um, anxiety around public speaking, but I don't seem to have it in these types of forums. I say these as just conversations with um, people who who want to have a conversation and that's what I'm all about. You put me in, in front of a crowd of 100, 200 people that I don't necessarily know, that's when I get quite nervous. So this platform, having a screen in between seems to help out. Awesome. Well, hopefully you get to keep doing it for a good long while, uh, just like us here at Liberty Radio. I have had a fantastic time uh, talking with you this afternoon, and uh, I can tell, you know, any time that uh, you want to come back on, especially if you've got something important that you feel that folks need to know about, I will get my tongue ironed out eventually. Um, anytime uh, you want to come back on Liberty Radio, just let me know and uh, we'll we'll get it on the calendar. Thanks, mate. Very much appreciated. And uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to come on today. Absolutely. Thanks for uh, showing up, especially with all the uh, issues that we encountered early on. Uh, you're, you're a champ for hanging in for all of that. <laughs> Not a problem at all, mate. It happens. Murphy's Law.